All right. Well, since the first few minutes are mostly me just introing everything, giving everybody background on the lecture series, I think we'll just go ahead and get started. Um, and if folks join late, that's no big deal. They're only going to miss me talking, which is not very important. So welcome, everybody, to my favorite lecture. Uh, this is a lecture series that MCCA came up with just for launching in 2022. And for those who are um, unfamiliar with uh, what we've been doing. Uh, this is our second one ever. I'll probably go ahead and take down the sharing real quick. This is our second one ever. Our first one was last month, and it was a record-breaking webinar for us, both in terms of the number of people who registered and the number of people who joined us live. Um, and, and for those who are new, some background on where we came up with the idea. Every year, MCCA gives out a bunch of awards for excellence in teaching for faculty, excellence in um, adjunct faculty, excellence in uh, outstanding uh, classified staff, so on and so forth. And when the colleges submit people for their awards, they often will include a paragraph or so of accolades or just really excellent um, attributes of why this person should win the award. And so as person after person after person back in November when we were in Branson was walking across the stage and we were getting to read all of this incredible stuff about our employees around the state, MCCA started having a discussion of this is an incredible resource. We need to be taking advantage of it. So I began reaching out to all of those faculty award winners and basically just saying, would you take an hour out of your day and give us your favorite lecture? Um, and favorite is a very subjective word that can be whatever these faculty members want to do, whether it is the lecture that gets the most response from students or has the most uh, life lessons or has the most uh, information in it that is going to help us tackle our next big challenge. Um, so I already cheated a little bit. I, I told you that this was our second ever one and I've already cheated. Dr. Susan Inman here is an award winning faculty member who is employed at MCCA. She's just not an MCCA CA award winner. And I mentioned that because the first person I reached out to was Charlotte Choate at OTC. And I said, would you do this? And she said, I'd be happy to do it, but you have to remember I'm a nursing instructor and my favorite lecture is bodily functions and infectious diseases. So I don't think that you want me to give that lecture. I'm not sure that everybody has the stomach for that. Um, in talking to her and talking to some other folks, we ended up got, getting connected with Dr. Inman, who, like I said, is an award-winning member of the OTC faculty. And we got into a great discussion about autism in higher education, really, really important topic. Um, Dr. Inman obtained her doctor in nursing uh, in 2016. She has been in pediatrics, pediatric intensive care, pediatric neurology, uh, family practice, and, and we're just really lucky to have her joining us today. Um, so as the elementary, as the secondary education environments have been really, really focused on trying to help students who have been diagnosed with autism, like I said, in the last 20 to 30 years, more and more of those students are now showing up in the higher education space. Um, and this lecture is an important one for obvious reasons, but it's also a personal one to me because I would like to think that my family member had a big hand in that. My mom was a speech pathology teacher for years, helped lots and lots of students with autism and eventually became an autism consultant um, for the state. So she travels around, she helps school districts, she takes a look at their protocols to make sure they're up to date. But number one, she's trying to make sure that the students, that the teachers, and that the parents are all set up for success. And when you think about all that it takes for a student to get to that high school graduation, the incredible effort that that student, him or herself has put out there, the support system that may be, by the time they get to that point, that support system may be dozens of people who have put so much time and effort into helping that student. And now that student has landed at your college. Maybe that student has landed in your classroom. So now, how do we help them? I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Enman again. Thank you, Dr. Enman, for joining us today. 
Um, this is always much, much better when we have lots of interaction. And I know Dr. Inman has said that she is going to, at points during her lecture, be calling out for responses or feedback in the chat. Or if you want to raise your hand and we can unmute you, we fully encourage that and make sure, trying to make sure that this is a conversation. So with that, I am going to turn my video off so you don't have to see me anymore. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Inman. All right. Okay, so hello, everyone. I am so very honored to be part of the My Favorite Lecture series, and I'm very grateful to the MCCA for this opportunity. I am really, really excited to be able to talk about something that I feel very passionate about, which is autism and higher education. Now, if we look at generations before us, to even say the words autism and higher education in the same sentence, when referring to a student with autism, rather than a student pursuing an education degree, it really wasn't all that common. <clears throat> but in the last few decades, that has changed. These changes have evolved into challenges that today's students face, but as educators, can we say that we have evolved too? So today we're going to be taking a constructive look at these students, specifically who they are, um, the barriers that they face in academics, and most importantly, how to help them to be successful when they are in college. So just a little bit of information about myself. I became a registered nurse back in 2008, and then I graduated with my bachelor's of science in nursing in 2012. I graduated with my doctor of nursing practice to be a family nurse practitioner from Missouri State University in 2016, where I received the outstanding project award of my graduating class for my project, the DART initiative, taking aim at developmental risk factors. And my project focused on identifying risk factors of autism in pediatric patients and quantifying that risk into a score so that earlier recognition of developmental difficulties and interventions can take place earlier, which is associated with better outcomes. I've worked in family practice and pediatric neurology as a nurse practitioner before I joined the faculty at OTC. Uh, as a nurse practitioner in the neurology clinic, I provided care for patients with developmental disabilities very often and working with those families to ensure that they were facilitated towards getting the needed IEPs and 504 plans related to their neurological diagnoses. I currently teach in the Associate of Science and Nursing program, um, which bridges LPN students towards becoming a registered nurse. My passion for this subject area comes from my son, Joshua, who was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. When you have the opportunity to be a parent, a sibling, a significant other, or even a teacher for an individual who is on the autism spectrum, it really gives you an insight, a compassion, a compassion and a, a, a deeper motivation to really understand the challenges that they face. So my hope for today is that I can share with you important information and insight that you will come away with a new or renewed motivation to look at your college for opportunities to improve higher education for individuals with autism. So another colleague here at OTC, Karen Forsey, she shared with me a poem that a student with autism in one of her English courses wrote. And this student has given permission for us to share it. <clears throat> I read it and I, I was just blown away. I just had to share it with all of you here. So here is just a little bit of an excerpt from it. To me, the world looks, sounds, and tastes odd. A foreign language I do not always understand. My mom told me I was made a different way, but I live just like anyone else day to day. I may talk and act a little different, but I don't let my autism hold me back. Just because I'm made different doesn't mean I should be treated different than anyone else in any type of way. 
I loved that I think outside of the box and understand the world may not always have my back. To me, everyone else is a little odd, but I treat everyone the same no matter the day. I would never want to be turned back. I like being different than others and having a greater understanding of the world in this day and age. I enjoy looking at things in an odd way. Those are just such genuine and amazing words. I mean, how profound is it to say that you enjoy looking at things in an odd way? You know, to look at the problems of the world in a conventional way will certainly not solve anything. Sometimes we all need to see through the lens of autism to be able to look at life and challenges in these odd ways to bring about new solutions. <clears throat> so who are we really talking about here? Students with autism, right? When you're in your classroom and you see these faces looking back at you, what thoughts might go through your head? Do you think that you could spot the individual in this picture with autism? Why don't you take a few moments to look at this picture and see if you can spot the student with autism and then we'll proceed on. So, how did you do with this photo? Did your eyes go to one student in particular? What characteristics did you automatically think of to use to search these faces for that individual with autism? Maybe you thought there were no students with autism because they all appear to be engaged in paying attention. Did you only think about this photo because I asked? And if so, what criteria came to mind when you looked for that student? The question is to ask yourself, why did you think the way that you did while looking at this photo? Well, one explanation is that every day we are exposed to assumptions and stereotypes. Individuals with autism are not always like Sheldon Cooper or Raymond Babbitt or Sean Murphy. These kinds of roles can create stereotypes in our minds of what students may look like or behave like. The truth is that this photo is just from a Google search of classrooms. But the question you should ask yourself is, were you making an assumption decision based on the appearance of the person? because autism is so much more than just a certain look. Have you ever heard the phrase, if you have met a person with autism, you have only met that one person with autism? Well, there's a reason it's called a spectrum and each person on it is truly an individual who is shaped by their unique experiences. Today, we are seeing more students with autism in higher education than ever before which may be because of earlier recognition and diagnosis in childhood. And subsequently, they are able to receive the support they need to be successful and go on to college. However, national st statistics indicate that only about 38% of college students with autism will graduate. Overall, students with autism have lower graduation, graduation rates as compared to neurotypical students. For many of these students with autism, living independently can hinge on their ability to graduate college and obtain a good paying job. That is just one of many reasons it is so important to be sure that your college is working to be inclusive and decrease these attrition rates. So what exactly is autism? In order to meet the diagnostic criteria for autism in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, they must have persistent deficits in three areas of social communication and interaction, and at least two of four types of restricted repetitive behaviors. So communication and interaction can include deficits in social emotional reciprocity, such as failure of normal back and forth conversation, a reduced sharing of interests, emotions, or affect, or even a failure to initiate or respond to social interactions. 
they may have deficits in nonverbal communicative behaviors for social interaction, such as abnormalities in high contact and body language, or deficits in understanding and use of gestures, to even a total lack of facial expressions and nonverbal communication. They may have deficits in developing, maintaining, and understanding relationships, such as adjusting behaviors to suit various social contexts, difficulty making friends, or an absence of interest in peers. Behaviors may be restricted, repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities, such as repetitive motor movements, use of objects or speech, they may have an insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines, or ritualized patterns of verbal or nonverbal behavior. They may experience extreme distress at small changes, difficulties with transitions, rigid thinking patterns, greeting rituals, need to take the same route or eat the same foods every day, and they may have highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal in intensity or focus. They may have a significant or lack of a reaction to sensory aspects of the environment, such as apparent indifferences to pain, temperature, or adverse response to specific sounds or textures. Now, the severity of these criteria help to determine where on the spectrum the individual will fall. There is a linear spectrum but there is also a circular one that displays, I think, more accurately the variability of characteristics among individuals with autism. Remember when I said that if you have just met one person with autism, then you've only really met that one person with autism? Well, watch this graphic and see how it changes and see how it really truly represents so much better the uniqueness of these individuals. Understanding that individuality in, in these characteristics among students with autism will go a long way towards autism acceptance and awareness. There are three levels of functioning for individuals with autism. Now, most students we encounter in higher education will meet the characteristics of level one, high functioning autism. Level of support needed can vary from student to student. Again, it goes back to that circular spectrum we saw where they may have stronger areas of functioning than other areas. However, for some students without any accommodations or disability services in place, it may decrease their likelihood of college success. Of course, students will not have on their autism name tag in class. So how do we know then which students are in need of support? The truth is you may never know if any of your students are on the spectrum. However, statistically, you have likely already had plenty of students with autism and you didn't even know it. While we're on the subject of names, if you take nothing else away from this presentation today, I hope it is this. I would encourage you to use person first language when referring to a student and their disability. Person-first language emphasizes the person before the disability. For example, you would want to say, Johnny, the student with autism, as opposed to the autistic student, Johnny. This is important for any individual with a disability, not just autism. You should always strive to see the person and not the disability. These individuals are not defined by their disability and we should always be very sensitive to that. So let's dig in a bit deeper about what a high functioning college student may present like. They may find it hard to understand what others are thinking or feeling. <clears throat> they may get very anxious about social situations. They may find it hard to make friends or preferring to be on their own. They may seem blunt, rude, or not interested in others without meaning to. They may find it hard to say how they feel. 
They may take things very literally. For example, they may not understand sarcasm or phrases like break a leg. They may have the same routine every day and that if that routine changes, that makes them very anxious. <clears throat> they may not understand social rules such as not talking over people. They may avoid eye contact. Getting too close to other people or getting very upset if someone touches or gets too close to them. Noticing small details, patterns, smells, or sounds that others do not. Having a very keen interest in certain subjects or activities. Liking to plan things carefully before doing them. And autism can sometimes be different in women and men. Women, for example, with autism tend to be quieter, hide their feelings, and they may appear to cope better with social situations. <clears throat> Students with autism may find it difficult to transition and adapt to college life because of social and emotional and organizational challenges. So they may struggle with those skills which fall under the umbrella of executive function. These struggles become more problematic when they need to adapt to classes with less structure than what they experienced in high school. The sights and sounds of crowded college classrooms and campuses can overstimulate and overwhelm them. Those who have sensory difficulties may struggle to study or socialize in these environments. The classroom challenges can lead to social isolation, which can lead to mental health concerns. Behavioral concerns such as outbursts or aggression as a result of autism are oftentimes what educators fear in the classroom. If you have this fear, you should really examine if it is because of stereotyping and assumptions through what you have seen in the media or on TV or in movies. Oftentimes, students with autism, autism in high school um, that had behavioral concerns have learned coping skills and um, if their accommodation plan includes it, they can leave the classroom where they are becoming overstimulated and find a quiet area to calm down and then return to the classroom when they are ready. <clears throat> they may have other medical co-conditions, which we will discuss next. And another barrier to their education is that they fear the stigma of a disability label and don't want accommodations that could actually help them to be successful. So let's talk about the co-conditions of autism spectrum disorders. They may have anxiety, including generalized, which is characterized by persistent and ex excessive worry about a number of different things. They may anticipate disaster or may be overly concerned about many different issues and find it difficult to control their worry. Social anxiety is extreme fear in social situations and settings. People with this disorder have trouble talking to people, meeting new people, and attending social gatherings. They fear being judged or scrutinized by others. Performance anxiety is fear about one's, one's ability to perform a task in front of other people. They may worry about failing a task before it has even begun. They might believe failure will result in humiliation or rejection. There is a risk of depression along with that increased suicide risk. Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or attention deficit disorder. They may have obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a chronic and long lasting disorder in which a person has uncontrollable recurring thoughts known as obsessions and or behaviors known as compulsions that he or she feels the urge to repeat over and over. <clears throat> Mood disorders such as bipolar, sleep disorders such as insomnia, epilepsy, Sensory processing disorders, which is a condition in which the brain has trouble receiving and responding to information that comes in through the senses, 
For example, being oversensitive to things in their environment, such as sounds, lights, textures, and touch. For some individuals, avoiding sensory input is what they prefer. For other individuals, they are, sens they are sensory seekers and they may have a need to move or touch all the time to provide that needed sensory input to their neurological systems. They may have auditory processing disorders. And that means that your brain doesn't hear sounds in the usual way, even though their ears are working properly. This is not a problem of understanding the meaning of what they hear, but they may find it difficult to follow conversations, know where a sound came from, listen to music, remember spoken instructions, particularly if there are multiple steps to those instructions. And they may really struggle in environments that are loud with competing multiple sounds. For example, if more than one person is talking in a noisy classroom. Sometimes these students may say that sitting in a class trying to listen to the lecture feels like they are trapped in a poorly dubbed over voice um, voiceover movie where the, the words being spoken don't seem to match the lips of the speaker. This can be frustrating for them and cause them to disengage from the lecture. On top of that, if they have social anxiety, so they're sitting way in the back of the class and an attention deficit disorder, that's just a recipe that makes for an incredibly frustrating experience for these students. <laughs> so some students may let you know about their diagnosis and other students may even be undiagnosed and have no idea that they meet the criteria for autism and therefore not understand why they have struggled with academics their whole life. The ADA defines a person with a disability as one with a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. Remember that legally you cannot ask a student if they have a disability, but if you have students who are interested um, in uh, accommodations or they're definitely in need of accommodations, then they should be directed to your college's disability services. The path to success does not have to diverge from disability and accommodation. Rather, they run parallel to each other and are equally important. Some students may already have an accommodation plan in place and let you know. Some students on the spectrum may not even need accommodations. For students that do not reveal that they have a disability, you may need to be able to recognize that they could be struggling due to the barriers that are oftentimes associated with autism and not even just autism, but all disabilities. For example, I had a student last year who was struggling in my course, and I noticed something was a bit inconsistent about her. There was a disconnect in her ability to discuss nursing concepts and nursing care, and then her performance on the exams. I asked if she would remediate the most recent exam with me to discuss the questions that she missed. After seeing her struggling to read the questions entirely and missing the key points, I approached it with compassion and just suggested some study tips and strategies. These, str these strategies can also work for an individual with dyslexia, though I didn't mention that to her. She actually began to cry and she admitted that all through her high school years, she had had an IEP for dyslexia. When she got to college, she was ashamed of her disability and she was trying to be successful without acknowledging her dyslexia needs. She didn't actually want any services or accommodations, but as a result of our conversation that we had and just showing her compassion and understanding, she was able to employ the study tips and strategies that we discussed and she began using the study strategies she had learned previously for students with the dyslexia, and she was able to successfully complete the rest of nursing school and graduate. And then she went on to pass her NCLEX examination and became a registered nurse. Remember that sometimes that is all it takes is compassion and understanding for individuals with disabilities. They just really want to feel accepted and supported like all of us. I'm, I, I just absolutely love success stories like this, and I'm sure you love to hear about them too. 
So if you have any stories you want to share, be sure to drop it in the chat box and share it with everybody. So help Dr. Students. Inman, while I've got you there, um, and please do throw those success stories in there. Um, sorry to interrupt, Dr. Inman. I was just, you paused there for a second, and we did have a question in the Q&A. So um, one of our attendees uh, pointed out that the blog for the Center for Autism Research states that some people in the autism community prefer you don't use the person first language because um, it can it can sound as if the autism autism is a disease or an illness. Um, and so what are your thoughts on that? Obviously, those are fairly subjective interpretations. Different people are going to react in different ways. Um, but but what are your what are your thoughts on on that? So my thoughts on that is to have that open conversation. Um, you can discuss with the student, you can kind of feel out their situation and see how they present themselves to you first. Um, if you're talking directly with a student. Um, the other thing too is when you're talking about that person first um, language, it can be also when you're talking amongst faculty or other individuals, the student, you may be referring to a student because there's something within the academic um, setting that you need to discuss that for whatever reason, their disability needs to be mentioned as well. And so in those cases, then the person first language certainly is something that you should consider. Um, again, it can be a very personal decision and, and choice based on the individual. Thank you so much. And thank you to, uh, it, it was an anonymous submission, but thank you to whoever threw that out there. That's a great discussion point. Yes, thank you. So helping students with autism doesn't have to be complex. In fact, you likely already have resources available to students that they just need to be made aware of to use. So resources like um, learning centers where the student can have access to tutoring, counseling services for students with mental health disorders, and, and um, maybe student referrals for financial issues and behavioral concerns. And if they don't have any accommodations and would benefit from them, refer them to your college's disability services. With accommodation plans, the accommodations should be reasonable and should not exert significant financial or time burdens on the college. If, um, uh, if you, they have those services in place, um, However, if you feel that accommodations are potentially unsafe or the student will be unable to meet the objectives of the course with those accommodations, you should reach out to your disability service representatives to, to discuss that. Um, it's also important that um, you have to know that these students can sometimes be very concrete thinkers. So you have to make sure that your instructions are very clear and very direct. So some interventions for students with autism can be what you would recommend for any other students as well. For example, when it comes to their medical co-conditions, it is best to encourage them to work with their medical provider in choosing appropriate treatments and medications. For mental health concerns, help them to seek out the resources that are available to them through your college and encourage them to seek out services and treatments through their medical providers. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful for many mental health concerns. CBT helps them to become aware of inaccurate or negative thinking so that they can view challenging situations more clearly and respond to them in a more effective way. If you've ever caught yourself telling a student that they need to respond to situations and not necessarily react to them, then perhaps CBT may be beneficial for them. Again, look into those counseling services that you might have available at your colleges. Don't forget to encourage them to have good nutrition. If food insecurity is an issue, see what college and community resources are available to them. Encourage regular exercise as it's conducive to a more stable mood and better sleep. And speaking of sleep, Contrary to popular belief, the best time to sleep is not during our classes. And if that seems to be a concern, encourage them to work on good sleep habits and hygiene and limit their caffeine intake. So caffeine can be a student's best friend or their worst enemy. 
Caffeine is, of course, a socially acceptable drug and can be used in moderation to increase alertness. But when it begins to affect other issues they may have, such as worsening anxiety and interrupting their sleep, again, it should be limited and in moderation. So students need to create a study space at home that is specific to their sensory needs. Are they a sensory avoidant person or a sensory seeker? Regardless, all study spaces should serve a purpose that meet their specific sensory needs. For example, a student who is unable to process sensory input from their, in, their environment well, such as a TV or music on, the, on in the background or a slight flicker of a lamp or seeing anything in their line of sight might be very distracting. So a desk like this where their focus can be controlled may be beneficial. Whereas a student who needs lots of sensory input may need to have on music in the background because silence is just too distracting. Students who need sensory input to help focus may also benefit from exercise balls to sit on, which have been shown to increase levels of attention, decrease levels of hyperactivity, and increase time on task while seated on the ball. This works by muscle activation of those core muscles, which can provide sensory input for the individual. Other sensory inputs um, activities can be things like the fidget spinners or anything with oral stimulation, such as chewing on a straw or chewing gum. Whatever the sensory input is, it should not be so strong as to introduce a source of distraction. It should enhance their ability to focus on the task of studying, not detract from it. So another activity that can be beneficial for students with autism is crossing the midline during studying. So the midline is an imaginary vertical line that goes from the head to the feet, which separates the right and left sides of the body. By crossing the midline, it promotes the coordination and communication of the left and right hemispheres of the brain. This can actually help to increase reading comprehension. So how many times have we heard students say, I promise I really did read the chapters, but the comprehension of what they read is not really there. Well, these midline activities may actually help them. So some of those midline activities include laying in the prone position while studying and crossing the midline to write, type, and turn pages. Another activity is to get on their knees to write or engage with the material. So remember how we talked about the students who are sensory seekers. They may benefit from a weighted vest, compression clothing, or even a weighted blanket while they're studying or in class. The compression and the weight gives them the sensory input they need, which allows them to focus on other tasks such as studying. Without the sensory input their bodies crave, it will cancel out any attempts of the frontal cortex to focus. <clears throat> For students who need sensory input, you can also have them use things like peppermint candies, essential oils, or a diffuser with peppermint while studying. Then you can trigger that sense of memory by having them chew peppermint gum during exams. All of these midline activities and sensory interventions will be most helpful if they're applied consistently. A student may be discouraged if they tried it just once and it just didn't work. It needs to become a study habit for a period of time to see if it is helpful for them. Start with a specific goal of time to trial these interventions and then align with a specific content or focus in the course. And then the student can analyze their performance to see if it was really beneficial. I think in some ways that we all have sensory needs based on the way our neurological systems uh, process sensory information. Have you ever had an itchy shirt tag or just a certain texture of food that you just can't eat or maybe a certain smell you can't stand or a texture or sound or something that is just completely intolerable to you? Of course, we have all experienced that. Well, what if you're what if you're um, you have autism and the entire world is your itchy shirt tag? 
Remember the student's poem from earlier where she said, to me, the world looks, sounds, and tastes odd. The world really feels like an all out attack on their senses at times. So we may experience just a glimpse of that, but individuals with autism experience that every minute of every day. Of course, we may not be able to completely change our classrooms to be sensory friendly, but there are just a few ways to help students in your classrooms who might have sensory processing disorders. So these things include fix those flickering lights, colored panels on the fluorescent lights to reduce glare, turn on or off certain panels of lights in the room when viewing videos or presentations, adjust the volume of audio, eliminate any competing sounds in the environment, <clears throat> Moderate your speaking voice to be calm and soothing. Check that the temperature of the room is comfortable. Provide frequent movement breaks for students. And keep a predictable routine. So for central auditory processing disorder, things that you could do include speak slowly, pause more often, emphasize keywords, and cut your instructions into chunks. Check that the listener has understood and use repetition and rephrasing when communication breaks down. Pair your verbal presentations or instructions with visuals. Use written supports such as email or mind maps and provide support for focused and attentive listening, such as worksheets, note pages, and allow them to preview the information prior to the verbal instructions. So again, with central auditory processing disorder, modifications to the environment that can improve speech intelligibility include covering sound reflective surfaces with acoustic panels to decrease reverberation, um, the surfaces such as whiteboards that are not in use, linoleum or wood floors. Use properly placed acoustic dividers. And reduce competing sounds by eliminating or moving external noise sources, such as um, fluorescent lights or electronics, electronics that hum from the learning space. For enhancement of the auditory signal for central auditory processing disorder, you could allow them to record the audio of your lectures. If you're watching, if they are watching your lectures at home, they can use earbuds to isolate your voice from the environment. And then you can actually use remote microphone hearing assistive technology, including individual assisted listening devices. Um, these may actually be required within an accommodation plan because they're just a little bit more invasive um, and a few more steps involved with, with that in between the speaker and the, the listener and the student. So. Group work for students on the spectrum can be a nightmare for them. Students who are on the spectrum, maybe the quiet one of the group, appear not to be contributing, but it is really their social anxiety and social deficits that prevents them from participating well. They may have great thoughts and ideas, and they can be a significant contributor in the group. Um, so it's important to understand that group work helps them to adjust to social aspects of college. So group work is important, but there are just some tips to help with this. So when appropriate, keep groups smaller so that the student feels comfortable enough to participate. Be sure that your instructions are very clear and direct to enhance understanding. If the room becomes too noisy, it can be difficult for the student to hear, so encourage the groups to spread out as much as possible, and if needs be, allow them to find a quiet spot in the hallway and then return in an allotted time frame. 
Common areas on campus may be a sensory overload nightmare for students with autism. Bright lights, noisy environments, and too many people can be anxiety provoking for them. So they may prefer to sit in their cars or find secluded seating areas to study. Even eating in these crowded areas can be anxiety provoking. So think about your campuses and see if there are any areas that can be sensory friendly. They should be located just off of the main traffic areas. And these areas should be relaxing to promote stress and anxiety management. If possible, you could include ball chairs at desks, rocker style chairs, sound panel dividers, even yoga mats, beanbag chairs, and weighted lap blankets can be added as well. The, the diverse sensory needs of these individuals can be met even on the biggest of campuses with a little bit of planning and consideration. So something that I will never forget was about nine years ago. I was in a clinical rotation in graduate school and the preceptor I was assigned to was talking about autism. She didn't know that I have a son who is autistic and she began to say that autism is mostly about the parents and that these children just need more discipline. I was utterly shocked and saddened by her ignorance and I tried to educate her on what autism really is. Unfortunately, stigmas like these are rampant in society and even though in recent years there have been efforts to improve this, it still exists. There are three types of stigmas that surround disabilities. There is public stigma, which is the prejudices, attitudes, and discriminatory behaviors of people in society. Structural stigmas, which can come from prejudices, attitudes, and discriminatory behaviors at the level of institutions, policies, and laws. And then there are self stigmas, which can be really difficult to address. This is where the individual with the disability is believing their own internal negative perceptions and internalizes those prejudice attitudes and behaviors of others. Remember the student I told you about who was ashamed of her dyslexia and was at risk of failing. That is how deep it can go. Um, it's even to the point that they deny what they need to become successful just because they're ashamed. As educators and as members of society, change begins with us and we have to work to change the stigma of disability by focusing on the abilities of the individual. Can you just imagine with more people who can think outside of the box and aren't tied down by stigmas and discrimination, what our world would begin to look like. You know, it kind of gives me goosebumps to, to think about. And I encourage all of you to take a look at yourselves and those around you to see how you can break down stigmas to create in the world what we so desperately need, which is acceptance and inclusivity. So that's actually all I have for you all today. Um, and I want to thank you for your gift of time. I certainly hope that you have learned some valuable information that you didn't know before. And most of all, I hope that you can use this information in your colleges to foster inclusivity for individuals with autism. And also don't forget that next month is April and that is Autism Awareness Month. So what a great time to promote these ideas and changes on your campuses. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Thank you so much, Dr. Inman. We do have some uh, questions that are lined up and we, have, uh, we, we don't put any kind of a time limit on my favorite lecture, but it's always, uh, it's usually somewhere in the neighborhood of an hour. So we still have a little bit of time here. Um, so Maria submitted this in the Q&A. My son is on the spectrum level one and I struggle to get him to ask for any accommodations. Very difficult teaching in a college setting and having him deny services. Also, unfortunately, many of the services that assist these kids are not covered by insurance, i.e. speech therapy is not covered for the pragmatic language issues in these young adults. Um, so, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't see a question in there, but I guess what would you as an educator um, encourage, if you are starting to recognize, um, you know, somebody who, um, somebody 
who could use help and maybe isn't asking for it, I know that that can be a very delicate situation. It, it can be. So the, the where to start is certainly with the disability services of the college, at least to explore what is available and what will possibly benefit. Um, I totally get what um, Maria is saying there. It seems kind of like after high school, it's, it's almost like a hot potato. They have so much support and so much um, opportunities for that while they're in high school, but then it's like college is here and it, it feels like it's a completely foreign world for them. Um, so my advice would be to start with the disability services of the college where he is at, to see what is available, to see what would be appropriate and what you all are comfortable with. And that's that's the most important part. Thank you very much. Um, okay, next question. Hannah uh, mentions that I notice you're using information from the organization Autism Speaks. There are people with differing um, uh, there are people with differing opinions of that particular source based on their approach. So are there any other sources of information you would recommend if, if someone is not comfortable using that particular source? There are actually several other organizations. Um, the Where I actually referenced from Autism Speaks was specifically for the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of, of um, the DSM-5, actually. So where I was going over the um, criteria for an autism diagnosis. Um, so there, I'm trying to think of the others. There's several, um, I can't think of them at the moment. Um, my email is here on the screen. If uh, Hannah would like to reach out to me, I would be more than happy to discuss with her um, some of those other potential resources. Awesome. And um, one more question, what is a mind map? So a mind map is for people, and I love mind maps. So those are for people who are very much um, engaged by visual types of representations of ideas. And so a mind map is, um, it looks like a, actually a very large web and it's connected with different lines and different ideas and different concepts so that you can not only think about how something is connected, but you can also visualize it. And so part of that visualization from a mind map really helps to solidify those concepts um, for, um, for individuals who, who struggle with um, connecting all the dots or seeing the big picture. Sometimes it's easy to get focused on those little details of things, and then you forget to look to see how it is all interconnected. And so mind maps are actually very useful for that. All right, if anybody has anything else, um, again, we can unmute you if you wanna raise your hand and, and interact a little bit. We've got tons of chats. We've got tons of thank yous. We've, we've had instructors here in the chat mention that they're going to use um, this, this insight and incorporate some of these practices and knowledge into their classroom. Um, um, again, next month is Autism Awareness Month. So anything that we can do here in our higher education environment to make things uh, more supportive of these students um, would be, uh, it, it, it can be a life changer. So um, thank you again, Dr. Enman. Um, we're going to put, if it's okay by you, uh, Dr. Enman, please make sure to send that presentation over to Katie and me, and we will put out both the video link uh, for YouTube of our My Favorite Lecture from today, and we'll also send out to everybody the presentation so you can have easier access to some of these slides and some of the information. Um, I am going to, if you don't mind, taking your screen down, Dr. Inman. Absolutely. I'm gonna put ours out so folks know when we're gonna be doing this again. Okay, so thank you again to Dr. Inman. So our next, my favorite lecture is going to be next month, Tuesday, April 12th at two o'clock in the afternoon. We've got Dr. Ayana Bridges, an award-winning MCCA award winner from Metropolitan Community College. She is an oral and speech communications uh, professor. And also, if I'm remembering right, this is off the top of my head, I believe she's in charge of MCC's Honors College as well. So she is going to be talking about audience analysis. 
Um, really appreciate everybody for coming in and, and joining us for these My Favorite Lectures. Like I said, these have been record-breaking uh, webinars for MCCA, both in terms of the number of people who have registered for this and the number of people who have attended live. Um, so clearly, um, if you have something that you want to hear about, or if you have um, a lecture that you think would really, really benefit everybody, there's a lot of interest right now. And hopefully this uh, lecture series is only going to keep on growing and growing and growing. Um, but with that, I am going to get out of this slide and make sure that we don't have anything else that needs to be addressed in the chat or in the Q&A. Seeing nothing but lots and lots of praise and thank yous for Dr. Enman, uh, I think we're going to call it. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. Thank you especially to Dr. Enman, and I hope that this is something that will prove valuable in your classrooms. Um, thanks again from MCCA, and hopefully we'll see you next month.